Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Connect Conversations. Today's conversation is all about purchasing and stores management for reliability, and it's brought to you in part as Mobius Connect's ongoing YouTube series, Connect Conversations. I am Kim Puger, the manager of Mobius Connect, and I will be your moderator for today's session. First, I'd like to take a moment to introduce our hosts of Connect Conversations, Series Global Reliability Improvement Experts, Doug Plucknett and Ron Moore. Don, Doug and Ron, are you there with me? Hello there. Hello. Hello. All right, fantastic. Well, before I pass the microphone officially over to you guys, I want to encourage everyone in our audience today to submit any questions that you have into the question panel of the GoToWebinar screen, and we will have... Doug and Ron answer your questions live today. Again, keep in mind, please enter them at any time during any conversation, and we will send those right over to Doug and Ron. Doug and Ron are here to provide their expert and perspectives from the years and experiences, and they are directly here to help you. All right, Doug and Ron, I'm gonna go ahead and pass things over to you. Okie dokie. Uh, Doug, you wanna go first? You want me to start or what? I think you're the best to start out, Ron. Why don't you go okay. ahead? <laughs> All right. And then you can correct me if I say something wrong. <laughs> uh, yeah, today we're going to talk about purchasing and stores, and uh, they're kind of two separate functions. I think the first thing that I wanted to talk about at a very high level on both of them is just make a couple of comments about each one. Uh, purchasing. The purchasing philosophy should be driven by total cost of ownership, not price. Price is a part of the total cost of ownership. And this is particularly true when you're buying something of, of, of what, something major, like a machine, a, a large component, that sort of thing, or when you're making a purchase for multiples, you know, hundreds or thousands of a particular uh, spare part. Total cost of ownership. And so what does that mean? Well, it's not just the price and the procurement effort. It's also things like energy consumption. Uh, it's things like repair costs. It's things like operating costs. It's things like loss of production and loss of maintenance efficiency when you buy a particular item. Because if you don't address those and you just go with the cheap price, you're probably, you're not gonna save a whole lot of money, I don't think, you know, because you may buy the cheapest and then you spend two or three times that downstream. So I guess that's, that's one comment. Uh, the second comment was about stores. For example, you know, I. I think the store, it used to be, I'll say this, is used to be that the stores was run by the maintenance manager. Now that used to be, that's like 20, 30 years ago. Uh, nowadays, it's almost always run by the purchasing manager because I think, you know, the, the store is the maintenance guy. What does he want in the storeroom? Well, a spare plant. You know, he wants everything readily available. Well, that's, that's just too much cash just sitting there, not doing nothing, you know, just waiting to be used when you could use that cash to make payroll, to pay off your debts, to pay interest payments, just a whole bunch of things. So you don't want to tie up that cash too much. And then the purchasing guy, of course, he's worried about the cash and usually goes up through accounting. And so he didn't want anything in the storeroom. So what's, you know, what's the resolution of that? Well, I think you ought to hold the purchasing guy and the stores manager both responsible for two measures. One is inventory levels or inventory turns. The other is stock out rate. You know, are the parts there when you need them? Because if they're not, you're gonna be losing a truckload of money in loss production and maintenance inefficiency. So those are the, you know, kind of two high level comments. One, one other comment on stores is this, what, what do you need to carry? Well, I'm gonna give you my hillbilly response. Well, what's breaking most often? 
you know, and what parts do you need for that? And usually that's things like, you know, bearings and belts and seals and fuses and, you know, whatnot, really. Well, make sure you have that because it's not a lot of money to be tied up, but it can have a huge impact on your uh, performance. And then the second question is this. So it doesn't fail very often, but when it does, it's a catastrophe. You know, you lose a month of production because of lead times and, and so on. Well, ask yourself, what's the consequence of failure in terms of money, you know, lost production inefficiencies? Second question is, what's the probability that that will happen? Well, maybe it's only 1%, but the consequence might be huge. So you have to balance the risk, you know, and the consequence against the carrying cost of the part. So if it's, you know, say $100,000 motor, probability of failure maybe 1%, consequence $10 million, well, you just paid for it, you know, in that risk. So you might want to keep that one. Anyways, I'll, I'll pause there. I don't want to monopolize all the time and just bounce it back to Doug because I've probably prompted him to think about two or three things while I was talking. <laughs> Doug. Well, um, when it comes to accountability, you know, between stores and purchasing, you mentioned uh, those two things that they ought to be responsible for. I'm, I'm also a person that says that, look, what's, what goes on in a particular building or plant really is uh, it should be a, a, a team event and they should be aligned with what operations needs to put out the door. Right. Right. So. Yep. If, if OEE is part of a responsibility, the operations manager should also be part of the stores manager. And they're going to go, geez, what, what piece of that do we have? Well, I'm going to tell you right now, it's measurable, right? When you talk about what stock out is, you know, if you start looking at why is the machine not running, well, there's one reason, right? And if you're responsible for it, yep. that's your piece of OEE. And we've all got pieces of that OEE that we can improve on. So. Yep. I, it's one of those things that I put that uh, in their lap as well. Um, I, I'm a person that, you know, you mentioned that, you know, 20, 30 years ago, uh, stores used to be run by maintenance. And uh, I'm not sure if that was better or worse, um, <laughs> right? As you said, the maintenance guys wanted everything. And so you had somebody working in that storeroom that, that probably was, uh, that believed in that. Um, at the same time, it was a person that when you said, hey, I need this, if they went to the back in the bin to get what they were supposed to get, they knew what they were getting, right? It wasn't just a part number to them. They knew what they were supposed to be putting their hands on, right? So you eliminate some of that when all of a sudden it comes back to the counter. And, you know, that's supposed to be a, a two-inch flange stainless steel ball valve not an uh, inch and a half brass gate valve. Whatever. Yeah. Right? <laughs> right. <laughs> and uh, it, it helps to have somebody in there. And I, I, I've i talked with customers throughout the years and said, look, there's times that we have people that, you know, they have hip surgeries and knee surgeries, guys that have been going up and down stairs and climbing ladders and things like that. Those are jobs to consider for that store's position. Somebody mm -hmm. that that understands what's in your building and uh, and then you need to work with them on the mentality of this is what inventory turns means and this is what obsolescence is and this is what it takes when, you know, because now you've got somebody working in there when they go, oh, geez, we've got all these parts from Machine X. Geez, we took that out of service six months ago. There's a person that should know, all right, anything that's associated with Machine X, I don't need in this stock room anymore, right? Unless, of course, we've got, y and z which were the same but again it's a person that would know that right yeah. so it helps to improve accuracy of what you have in your inventory by having somebody that, that's worked in that building and around that equipment not just a person that's that's there to you know put stuff on the shelf and take stuff off the shelf and and account for all of it right yeah. Unless your bill of material and your planning and scheduling and, and all that is just superb, which it's not in most cases that I've been around. <laughs> it's far from superb. But you know, there are a few out there. You know, I'll, yeah. I'll give them credit for it. You know. 
Uh, one other, uh, another comment I wanted to offer and then pitch it back to you, Doug, is, you know, th there's a hidden cost in poor stores management. And I want to just touch on what that hidden cost is and maybe how to calculate it. The, uh, you know, in talking to guys who work in the plants, what they tell me, and th these are nominal figures, you can figure the details out for yourselves, but Notionally, a, a maintenance technician will waste about an hour a day dealing with parts. Yep. Getting the parts, finding the parts, making sure you got the right parts, expediting the parts, you know, returning the parts that are wrong and all that sort of thing. So just, just think about the implications of that on maintenance efficiency and on production. So you can go through the numbers and say, well, let's let's suppose I got whatever, you know, pick a number, two or three million dollars worth of stuff in the storeroom. Well, what's that costing you? What well, is an opportunity cost, cost of capital for you know capital that's sitting there not earning a return? And maybe that's 10 percent. There's an overhead cost with that. And, you know, that's the, the staff and the taxes and the building and, you know, so on and so forth. Well, what's that? Well, maybe that's another, you know, 10 uh, percent. And then you got some other things around, you know, uh, shrinkage, you know, stuff gets lost or stolen or whatever. Maybe that's a, a percent or two. Anyways, you got you, now you got a number. What's it costing you just to run the stores? Right. Well, what's it costing you not to have the parts when you need them? You know, so if you don't have the ability to do planning and scheduling and kidding so the parts are there, you don't have people in the store that, that understand, like Doug just said, you know, the parts to pick for a, uh, you know, for a job, you know, you're going to lose an hour a day maybe on each guy. So you got 100 guys in a big plant, you know, you do your own math, 100 guys, 50 bucks an hour, uh, an hour a day times 200 days. Well, that's a pretty big number, you know, that you're giving up because you don't have the right systems in place. And then take take that a step further. What are you losing in production? Because the system is down, you're waiting for the parts and you're scurrying around like, you know, rats in a silo looking for parts and you don't have them. So you're not producing. So what's the cost of that? So there are lots of hidden costs in terms of production losses and maintenance inefficiencies that you have to balance against, you know, the the cost of the storeroom, you know, all that sort of thing. So uh, what I've found, if you actually run the numbers, is not having a proper storeroom uh, costs you more in those hidden costs than it does to have a proper storeroom. So. Uh, just throw that out there. Bounce it back to you, Doug. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that uh, well, this is before I uh, left Kodak, that, and we were struggling at the time as a company and, and trying to reduce inventory costs. And uh, you know, we had a group of people put together to try to brainstorm that and and say, you know, how do how do we go about doing this? And, and the reality of it was. Um, in terms of the, of the maintenance folks, yeah, we had stuff uh, that we could look at that, that wasn't turning. That was one way. But where we got the most for our money was to say, we need to stop with these brand new capital projects, having purchasing go out and get bids from three and four companies for every type of electric motor, every type of pump, every type of uh, starter, valve, actuator, all those things, right? It turned out, you know, we had 15, 20 different brands of motors in stock across the company, right. right? And we said, all right, what are the things that we can look at that have the same footprint, right, in terms of if you replace one, it doesn't matter whether it's brand A or brand X, right? Mm -hmm. Let's let's take a look at, we'll make a decision on, here's the two brands of valves that we're going to carry, right? Be it Milwaukee or Apollo or whatever right yep uh they all have the, the of the 18 brands we had right a two-inch flange ball valve is a two-inch flange ball valve it fits in the same location 
just like every other ball valve, right? So let's put together a, a design of experiments and, and, and put some valves through a testing cycle and we'll actuate them every 15, 20 seconds and we'll see which ones last the longest. We'll deem those as most reliable, the same with the actuator. And now we'll take and say, this is what we're gonna use from here on out and we'll get rid of all the other ones. And we did that, it was huge savings, right? Hundreds yeah. of times more than what we eliminated by looking at, at inventory turns, because all of a sudden we didn't have to carry 18 different brands of valves, 18 different brands of actuators, and all the little parts and pieces that you might replace with them. You know, in terms of how they couple together, and and uh, if you're if it's get the larger sizes, we were rebuilding them. You know, four inch and up, we're rebuilding. But we did that with every type of, of valve, right? To say. All right, from here on out with new projects, now all of a sudden we had the leverage to go back to those companies that we picked and say, you need to give us a better price. We used to use 18 different other types of valves, and now we're using you. All right, give us a better price on this because you're going to be selling a hell of a lot more valves to our company than what you did in the past. Right. And that's really what makes sense in terms of stocking, right? I get the, the pressure that they put on purchasing of go out and get bids, right? But sometimes that those bids end up creating the wrong behaviors. And that's certainly what we're seeing. And I see that in a lot of companies I work with. Well, it's because they're driven by price, yep. not by total cost of ownership. <laughs> so what, one uh, comment I had relative to, uh, you know, what you keep, I was working with a German company and the guy comes in and, you know, the VP of purchasing, I think he was, he was a big dog. And uh, he, he says something to the effect of, we got parts in there that we haven't used in five years. And I think I caught him off guard because I said, well, that's good news. And, and he's like, <laughs> why is that good news? I said, well, it hadn't broken. You know, if, if you still got the machine and it's reliable, but if it does break, what's the consequence of that? Yeah. Right. So yeah. he wasn't thinking through, we got stuff we haven't used. Well, do we really need to have that there to manage the risk of a failure in that component? What's the consequence on production? What's the consequence on maintenance? What's the consequence on engineering or whoever? And, you know, so you got to take it that next step. The fact that it hasn't, you haven't used it in five years, it's kind of meaningless unless you go back and say, well, do I still have the equipment? Like you mentioned earlier. And yep. if you don't, well, then, yeah, you don't need it. See if you can get some salvage value out of it and get rid of it. But if you still have the machine, well, you better think it through. You know, think, try to think at a systems level in terms of risk and consequence to the business as you may try to manage all this stuff. You know, I, uh, another kind of little war story, I've, I did a keynote for a, a big U.S. company at their annual conference, their engineering conference. And after I spoke, the, the purchasing manager got up and spoke. And, and she said, last year we saved the company $200 million or 300, maybe 300 million. Pick a number. Hundreds of millions. <laughs> and, and I thought, wow. And by the way, this has happened twice to me. Right. Right. Purchasing manager comes in talk. One of them said we saved a billion dollars. Well, in in both cases, I pulled out their financials and looked at their you know their income, their revenue, their costs, and their profit, and it hadn't budged. You know, I mean, it was steady. You know, within about Same fifty million. <laughs> so. I had lunch with Paul. He was VP of manufacturing. And I said, Paul, you remember this morning when Bob said he saved y'all, you know, whatever, $300 million. And he said, yeah, I, I remember that. And I said, well, look at this. It's gone missing. You know, that $300 million didn't show up in the bottom line. And so I thought, well, there's something going on here that we don't understand, you know. So maybe you guys ought to go back and have a rethink of this in terms of the consequence to the business when you make these decisions about what you're going to buy, what you're going to stock and so on. So anyways, I'll bounce it back to you, Doug. 
Yeah, I've had uh, that one. I've also had, uh, I'll raise some eyebrows with a statement that uh, somebody said, not only should we look at what's not turning, we should look at what's turning too often, right? Where's, this, where's the junk we're buying? Is Would we be able to pick that out by stuff that's turning over and over and over again? And yeah. uh, I, I said, boy, it's kind of a common sense statement. I guess I've never looked at it that way, but it might be something you could look at down the road and say, gee, you know, what are the, what's the junk we're buying? Uh, yeah. is that, does that come out through, is we're seeing it having to be replaced too often? Yeah. Um, the other piece that uh, I I work with uh, customers on, because I've seen this if, event before, is they'll have items listed in their inventory, um, and you can see it through, you know, uh, they have a, a tool like a uh, CMMS where they can look at the inventory and what's in there, and it'll have a description of what's there, and the equipment ID that it's tied to, but you don't ever see the nameplate information, right? And I always tell them, geez, if a motor's got a nameplate on it, you ought to have a picture of that. It ought to be tied with with what's in there. Same thing with gearboxes and pumps and things like that that, that have that nameplate information because that's important. You want to make sure you're getting the right one when you go to buy something, right? Uh, I did work with a customer once that really struggled with uh, a line that they were having that you know, they, they did some uh, maintenance on that line, and then all of a sudden they weren't able to make great right on it, and they struggled for a while to the point where they actually brought me in to help them. And, and what it came down to is somebody replaced gearbox, and the ratio was different on the one that was in the stock room, right, to what they took out. And yeah. the mechanics, you know, it happened in the middle of the night. They didn't think about it. Well, heck, by the time they figured out what it was, they changed pressure on <laughs> On later the control valves, right? Five, six, eighteen different changes all of a sudden, and they're wondering why is this thing not running the way it should? Simple nameplate information is important for what we do, right? And how we make things. So it should be available uh, to your maintenance people when they buy something, and, and as part of their their checklist or their job plan, it should say check that nameplate information. Make sure you're getting one for one what you're replacing with. All right to what you took out uh, important yeah. stuff yeah uh, on the uh, and I want to come back in just a second to the, something you brought up earlier you know creating some sort of strategic alliance with your supplier you know narrow it down to you know maybe two people I'm uh, I'm not real keen on sole source I mean I know you know, if you have, like the Japanese do, this karetsu, that that may work for you. But you know, I don't know about how that's, well, that's going to work in the American psyche. You know, the way we deal and want to constantly torque people down and then they want to, you know, kind of squeeze us back or not supply, you know, as good a quality <laughs> as they were or whatever it is. You know, everybody's got to make money. So, anyways, I you know I'm kind of aligned to you. You might have a primary and a backup, or sure, you know, have, or even have something that you can bounce against relative yeah. to what the one guy is supplying, not just in price, but also in service and quality and all that sort of thing. So even to go from fifteen eighteen down to two or three makes yeah. a big difference, right? Going to one would be a little bit crazy, right? But have it going down. And limiting those to say, if we're going to use a motor, it's these one or two brands, right? Yeah. If we're going to use a centrifugal pump, it's these two or three brands. And we're done with having 10 and 12, yeah. right? One one thing, you know, another thing is more high-level stuff, or, you know, in terms of philosophy and strategy and that sort of thing is, you know, when you, when you run in a storeroom, run it like a store, Right. Like a business, you know, too often I see storerooms run more like an afterthought. And you mentioned it earlier, bringing somebody in that's uh, kind of walking wounded and you put them in the storeroom because you don't have another job they can do. Well, that may not be the best approach, you know, I mean, it may be OK if they're properly trained and all that. But anyways, but running like a business, you know, that if if you I'm talking to the folks out there right now, if 
you know, if, suppose your rich uncle died and left you a store, you know, but in his will, he said, you got to, you got to run it for the next five years before you sell it and, and reap the gains of what I've put into it over my lifetime. So he wants you to earn some of that money. So the question I would ask you, you know, you're now running this store. Would you keep it clean and tidy? Oh, well, I reckon absolutely. you would. Yeah. <laughs> would would you uh, work real hard to make sure you had what your customers needed when they came in to buy stuff? Yeah. Well, of course you would. <laughs> would you try to minimize the amount of cash you kept tied up in the storeroom and still meet your customers' requirements? So you'd start to balance those competing interests, wouldn't you? Well, of course you would. Um, would you work with your suppliers to try to make sure they provided you with high quality stuff when you needed it, but not too soon, not too late. Yeah, and I know you got to have some buffer in there to manage variation in what they do. <clears throat> you know, at, at five o'clock, would you hang a sign on the door that says, come on in, help yourself, leave the money on the counter, I'll get it in the morning. <laughs> well, hell no, you wouldn't do that. That'd be stupid. So, well, if that's how you would run your personal store, well, why wouldn't you run the storeroom like that? Would, would you have barcoding? Well, of course you would. That's a huge inefficiency if you don't. Would you, uh, oh, would you keep, you know, certain things uh, appropriately climatized? You'd, you know, you'd keep the meat in a cooler, wouldn't you? Well, likewise, you're going to have to keep, you know, certain components in a cool, dry place, like electronic components. So just think through the storage requirements for all that stock and run it like uh -oh. a store. You know? So, all right, I'll hush now. Back to you, Doug, unless you want me to keep talking. <laughs> oh, we've well, you lost froze it. for a minute, so I'm looking uh, at a message that I got up there. <laughs> okay. Anyway, yeah. um, we're back. so what's your thought on, uh, I see this at uh, not as many sites as I used to, uh, the giveaway bins, nuts, bolts, washers, screws, uh, anchors, um, yeah. gaskets, commonly used things where they just yeah. have an open area and, you know, you might have to swipe your, your ID going in, uh, but it really doesn't track exactly what you take out until yep. you know the end of the week or the end of the day when they come and they restock right well generally i support that you know because it just makes stuff easier to get so you you want to make it easy for the you know the mechanics and the, all those guys electricians and so on to get what they need without having to be burdened with too much uh, you know too much red tape but there's, there's some caveats around that one of them is that somebody has to manage those bins and make sure that the stuff is properly stocked. It's the right stuff in the right bin with the right, you know, everything associated with it is right. So somebody needs to be assigned to that. You can't just have a free for all and the vendor does all the stocking and nobody in the plant is responsible for making sure it's right. So that that's one thing. Another thing I think you got to do is you've got to, what encourage honesty in your workforce. Now, some people are going to steal some of that. Well, steal that. It's kind of an overstatement. They're going to borrow it. You might not ever get back, but, but they're going to, and that's okay. You know, it's kind of like people taking a pen or a pencil from the company supply room. Who cares? You know, it's just not enough to worry about. Now, if they take, you know, 10,000 pens or, you know, eight reams of paper, then that's a different thing. So just encourage people. You have to create a climate where, you know, you're just saying, look, I expect you to be honest with this. And I expect you to, you know, take care of it just like I would anything else around here. So, you know, with, with those two caveats, I, I think it's probably a good thing. It, it, you have any counter experience to that? Yeah. Um, nothing counter. I, I would say that, uh, those that are considering doing it, uh, they should expect a, a, a high cost the first couple months. Because uh, typically what you see the, the trades people do is 
they'll have their own little bins inside their toolbox right. so they don't have to walk whether it's uh you know where i work it could be come down seven stories uh to to get to the place uh yeah. so they'll fill their own little bins in their toolbox those first couple months and and you'll think holy smoke's gonna cost us an arm and a leg once you once they get over that uh it's it's relatively far more efficient than make them go to the storeroom and again you have that time right savings of of not having to go there and uh pester your store clerk to get things they use on a daily basis right yeah yeah again though you have to make sure that the parts that are in you know the loose parts that are in there are the right ones because you don't want to pull out a you know a cheap bolt when you really need a grade nine stainless right and and it's the you know it looks the same as far as you can tell yeah. but it's not and then you have a really serious problem on your hands sometimes so yeah, again, it has it has to be managed and and run appropriately. So now uh, I got my I got some notes here. Let me just pull them out. See if I've missed anything. Yeah, we've sort of covered all that. Covered barcoding, well lit, tidy. You know, we kind of touched on that. The ease of access. You know, having tools you need to make it easy to access the stuff. Having stuff, you know, clearly marked with the stuff and, and located appropriately. So the stuff that's, uh, you know, you use a lot. It's either, you know, in some sort of satellite store there near where the folks are, or it's close to where you are. So you can, you know, make sure you it's it's handy to, to attend to. Uh, having uh, two or three other things. If your planning and scheduling system is really good and you've got, you know, the nameplate information, the bill of material. So when you put the plan together, you also identify the parts. That parts requirement goes to the storeroom. They pick the parts. They put them in a bin or a location. And then that gets located appropriately. Sometimes even at the job site. Other times it's in a specific area. Where you know where you're, you know, expect to pick up the parts for a particular job. So if you have all that, that makes the maintenance guys a lot more efficient, and it's worth the effort if it's properly done to have an extra guy or, you know, somebody else, you know, one more person in the storeroom to attend to that. And in fact, at at night. I think I would have some in a big plant. You know, we didn't do this in a small plant, but in a big plant at night, I'd have somebody on shift doing nothing but picking parts and getting them ready okay. and doing, yeah, and doing cycle counts to make sure that things are accurate and maybe even doing receipt inspection. You know, they're going to be busy getting ready for what? the next day or two or three days from now so that you make the whole uh, system you know more efficient if if you've ever been in a grocery store at two o'clock in the morning you know what this means you know, <laughs> they they've got people busy restocking cleaning out back receiving and you know putting things in the appropriate place so it's it's a very similar kind of mindset so that you make things easy for your customer, you make things easy for the folks doing the work, you try to accommodate all that, and then things go a lot more smoothly. So that's, you know, a couple more comments. Oh, one one thing we didn't mention, uh, rotating the shafts on your motors. Now I know that's a really common thing that people talk about, but there has to be a structure to it. You know, everybody knows you're supposed to do that. Do you do it? And how do you know you do it? So is that somebody in the store that's supposed to go around and, and rotate, you know, twist the shafts on the motors? How do you know it got done? Is it supposed to be done periodically? You know, who does it? Is it maintenance or somebody in the storeroom? And you got to work through all that and make sure there's a there's some discipline and a process for doing that. Otherwise, you're going to start that machine up and it's going to go and poof. So, uh, 
Yeah, oh, receipt inspection, particularly for critical components. Are you doing appropriate reviews of what you got in to make sure it's right? You know, because if you don't, you get it, you put it on the shelf. It's, you know, the, the most, most recent example I can think of is I bought a new pair of shoes online. I got them in. Now, I could have just put them in the closet and said, yeah, I'll put those on later. I tried them on. They didn't fit. <laughs> well, my receipt inspection said, dang it, you know, and apparently these shoes are made a little bigger than some others because I normally wear it 10 and a half wide. Well, that's what I bought. Well, it didn't fit. It was too big. So receipt inspection, you know, becomes an, an issue. And I guess one of the last comments is counterfeit parts. <coughs> they're, they're a big problem today. And so you really need to make sure that you're buying from reputable suppliers who are verifying that those supplies, those parts you're buying or that's the, that equipment is really legit because there's a lot of crap out there. And, and it's not just mechanical stuff. It's electrical stuff. It's chemicals. It's a bunch of stuff. It's everything. It's everything. Yeah, that we're buying. And a lot of it is coming from, well, you know where. You know, without disparaging any particular country. So a lot of it is just, it's just not right. And that puts you at a disadvantage and that serious risk in some cases. Because if you've been sold, a, you know, a large bearing on the cheap and it fails after a you know month or two or six of operation. And then you're down for a month or a day even. And that's a big deal. So. You know, be really cautious about counterfeit parts, because if the deal looks too good to be true, it's probably too good to be true. So back to you, Doug. I've rattled on enough. <laughs> I think you pretty much covered everything that I could think of. Uh, you know, outside of, and I mentioned this early on, is is working together with stores to to test out components to make sure that we. Uh, we end up with those reliable manufacturers. I, I can tell you that uh, I've, I've seen it with uh, pipe fittings uh, where they had an abundance of sand holes and fittings. Uh, so here they put something together, install it brand new, and they go to pressure test it. And, you know, out of, uh, let's say, 220 90s that were, or t 90s and Ts that were installed, they had uh, 18 of them leak. Right. You're just sitting there shaking your head going, OK, where did these come from? And when you find out, oh, we didn't get them from our regular supplier because we had this large project going on. We got them from somebody else that gave us a deal. Well, you're yeah. right. It wasn't much of a deal when you end up having to do a bunch of rework. Yeah. Uh, Let's see. Now, we got a question, Doug. The uh, question is, do you have any helpful tips to make sure the parts in the warehouse keep up to date? with the revisions and or upgrades in the field? Well, it's the old management of change process. Uh, yeah, that's and the first word that came to my mind. A piece, <laughs> a piece of that. Uh, and I, I will say, I don't know what percentage of companies you come across that actually have a good management of change uh, process in place. But for me, I would say it's uh, maybe one in 10. Uh, it's not a lot. Well, they'll have a process. Yeah. I mean, most most all companies have a process for management of change. The question is, is it being used? Is it effective? And is it sufficient? You know, all those kinds of things. And generally, it's not. Um, yeah. I, golly, I don't really have any great tips for this. But when you make a change, you know, the engineering department that's making the changes uh, whether it's process or, you know, the capital guys, when they're making those changes, there should be, a, you know, a, a note that goes to, you know, the, the maintenance guys and to the storeroom that says, hey, we've made this change. The parts are different now. All that stuff you got that's in there, probably not any good anymore. Right. So unless you've got that link between, you know, the, the people making the changes and the storeroom or the and or the maintenance guys, it's probably not going to happen. So I guess the key thing there would be to have a standard or, or 
procedure or checklist in place where that gets done when you make changes as a part of your manager change process. Did you, you have anything else there, Doug? No, I agree with you 100%. In, in fact, this is becoming a, a larger issue uh, the more we automate and computerize our systems because uh, those parts, the obsolescence uh, uh, is typically, you know, somewhere between 18 months and two years where we're seeing uh, some things like I.O. cards go obsolete, uh, programming changes. Uh, so we need to have to make sure that we have a backup program and that's kept somewhere and that is kept up to date and who made those changes and how do we go back if something doesn't work or we end up with a glitch. All those things now are uh, sometimes becoming part of the responsibility stores if we keep that in a, in a place where, you know, somebody can find it when they need it, right? Yeah. So. Well, it's, it's an ongoing issue, but, you know, I, I guess, you know, unfortunately, it just strikes me is, is that, you know, if you don't have a bill of material for existing equipment, you know, then it's going to be really hard for you to manage the change that's occurring in a piece of equipment for which you have no existing bill of material. Um, so that, you know, those two issues need to be addressed so that if you do make a change, you can go into the, you know, the equipment's bill of material. You can say, well, that's no longer this, it's now this. But that has to, that link has to occur beginning with the person who's making the change and tied back into the, the storeroom and or maintenance. So um, I had a, one or two other comments about purchasing, uh, and, but I'm going to turn it back to you, Doug, if you want to you know, comment on anything else before I get nope, into a couple I am, of uh, uh, again, you know, when you look at bill of materials, that's something that should be part of your your capital project. Uh, I realize that that is uh, one of the places we lots of companies fall down. Um, they they wait far too long to say, uh, here's what the BOM is for this new project uh, and the equipment that we put in. And sometimes it doesn't get done underneath that capital money. And if it doesn't get done, then the likelihood of it getting done in the future is slim. And uh, if it does get done, it'll be relatively incomplete. Um, yeah. You know, one one part, one uh, subsystem at a time, typically. Yeah. Well, you know, I've of course, I spend time in these plants. But one of the questions I ask from time to time is how many of you guys have a bill of material for all your equipment? Now, it, you know, if it's a, a fan in a toilet, I don't care. <laughs> but I'm talking about the stuff that's important to you. How many of you have a complete bill of material for all the, the important equipment, you know? Some people use the word critical, but, you know, anyways, I don't have any hands go up. No, I haven't had the first one yet. <laughs> yeah. So, so it's kind of a big issue, particularly if you're going to try to run the storeroom well and have maintenance attuned to what's needed for their parts when they go to make a repair to get the machine back online so you can produce your product. So that strikes me as being something that's really needs uh, you know a lot of attention you know if you're going to if you're going to be able to do what we've been talking about effectively so well, i don't i hope we've answered the guy's question but if you have yeah. a follow on be glad to take it offline or try to answer it now right i mean sadly ron if you look at it this way and you're you're doing a capital project and let's say it's it's 20 million dollars and the boss tells you uh you need to cut uh, 10 percent of that out right gee how much is the bill of material going to be on uh in terms of stocking on right. that 20 million dollar project right pretty easy place to cut isn't it yeah well there's things that get cut <laughs> or, or, or you know. you're over budget Right. Set, setting up the PMs, you know, loading the CMMS, all that just that's easy to cut that crap out and say let maintenance do that later. Exactly. 
and it it never quite gets done. You know. Anyway, so just a couple of comments on uh, supplier partnerships. The first thing I think you need to do is relative to major components is to analyze current operating results. You know, are you getting good reliability? Are you getting high performance? Are you getting you know good OEE? ease of access and ease of maintenance and ease of operation and then take that and put it into some sort of a a, you know an analysis for each one and then go to your suppliers and say look we've got these issues these opportunities if you want to call them that otherwise known as problems that we need your help with and then work through that to see what they can do to help you mitigate or minimize you know all those issues and you got to put in place, you know, some basis for the relationship and who's the point of contact and all that sort of thing. But, you know, there has to be a structure to that that's focused on improving the operating results for which you both get rewarded, right? They get more business, you get more production, more efficiency, whatever it is you're looking for. And then out of that, you have a good relationship. And then you continuously adjust and adapt that to the circumstance that you find you, yourself in, you know, year after year. If, and if you've got that, then you've got a good, you know, supplier in your, uh, you know, in your quiver. One thing that gets brought up from some time to time is should I have my suppliers do RCM analysis on equipment? Well, I think the short answer is yes, but, and Doug, you'd be more familiar with this than I am, but the, the, the but part is this. If you require this, you have to participate. You can't just say, go do it and expect it to get done without your operating context, your current failure modes that are causing you the most issues, your act of participation in all this, to make a business decision that's good for both you and your supplier and not just arbitrarily impose something for which they don't have that information. So if you're going to impose that, you know, it's probably a good thing, but it's going to cost you more short term, probably not long term, but it's going to cost you a little more short term because you have to be an active participant in the analysis and the decision making. So I'll bounce it back to you, Doug. Um, I can tell you, I have never had a company say, go work with our supplier without providing people. Typically, it's we're going to bring the supplier in. Um, the smart ones that I've worked with, uh, you know, let's say that if I've worked with a dozen companies that use suppliers, I had two or three that's, that made the supplier sign off on, if we come up with improvements to your product, you're not going to give them to our competitors. Right. Yeah. So um, that is something to think about. Uh, they will know and will have seen um, some typically some more things that you may not have seen in terms of your equipment, in terms of failure mode. So it is useful to bring them in. Um, and they are also, uh, you know, if you're going to do this, don't be <laughs> bringing in uh, a sales rep. You want a field right. service technician. Uh, to be yep. doing that with you, somebody that's actually hands-on knows that stuff, or somebody that's assembling it, right? But typically, I, I tell them you want the field service technician to be the person you're involved with. So. Yep. Yep. Amen. See what? We, yeah. Well, we're coming up on the. Even though we start a little late, we're coming up on the um, end time for the for this session. Any any other thoughts, Doug? I don't. I think no, I've, um, uh, I've I can spent tell you what's on my mind for the time being. <laughs> in, in terms of my expertise, I'm pretty limited when it comes to the the stores and per. Well, we we had a, a disruption there, Doug. You, we lost you for a second. Uh, um, again, I have to deal with them when uh, you know, having been worked. Uh-oh. The biggest thing, the biggest thing is to uh, have them involved in the plant uh, and and what it takes to get that done. They should be partners in that, 
And if they are doing that, you'll you'll have a, a I think a better run uh, yeah. storeroom. Yeah. Well, we we probably need to wrap this up. Uh, don't have any more great comments on the managed change process. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. It wasn't a question. It was just a comment. Um, the uh, you know the the key thing in my mind in all of this is to try to think at a systems level. You know, not just your little silo where you're trying to cut back on the inventory levels yep. or where you're trying to reduce the, uh, you know, the stock out rate or where you're trying to get a particular vendor in that you like. Think at a systems level about the consequence of your decisions and what's that, what that's going to do to the business. So there's concepts of total cost of ownership run your storeroom like a store, like a real bona fide business and, and so on. Just try to think through those things as you're making these decisions and you'll probably get better decisions. It may not be perfect, but who is, uh, you'll, you'll get better at it. So I'll, I'll pause or stop there. All right, Ron, it's been good talking with you again today. Yeah, likewise. Hey, what's what's with this, you know? Well, let's just say that, uh, you know, Christmas is getting close. Oh, are you playing Santa Claus? <laughs> <laughs> Every time I've tried that, I get crop failure. So I, I just don't have any any ability to grow that. So, uh, <laughs> all right. Well, well, we'll close it with that uh, Santa Claus note, guys. And thank you for joining us. And I hope it's been uh, useful to your the way you're thinking about all this stuff. We'll see you next time. Bye. Have a great day.